Welcome back to another video and today we are talking about data management. Specifically, we're going to look at how to structure data in a relational database. A relational database is the most common database that you would find in an organization. And a relational database is a series of related tables stored together with a minimum of duplication to achieve a consistent and controlled pool of data. And the basic structure for storing information in a relational database is a table. In fact, the word relation is another name for table and that's why they're called relational databases. So here we have an example table and it's just a series of columns and a series of rows. Now the columns store the fields. So each column is called a field and a field is the smallest sensible amount of informa for information that you want to store about something. Now if we take as an example something customers so let's say that this table is going to store information about customer customers so this is the customer table the sort of thing that we would want to store about our customer our name and address phone number, email address. And we've already started splitting the customer up into small sensible chunks of, of information that we want to store, name and address. But actually we should go further, or, or in fact, should we go further? So if we take name, we could store name like this and then have a particular customer like that. The question is, is this sensible? Or could we split it up into something smaller that's sensible? And the rule of thumb here is, do we ever want to access John independently of Smith? And we would if we ever wanted to write an email that started Dear John rather than Dear John Smith. If we wanted to write an email Dear John, we would have to store John on its own. So is that the smallest sensible amount of information related to a customer's name? Well, it probably is. We could go further. We could store the J in a separate field, the O in a separate field, the H and the N in separate fields. But um, most organisations would say that that's not sensible for them. There may well be a, a company somewhere for which that is sensible, but I can't think of it. First name and surname. I still haven't spelt name right. First, right, in fact. So we would store name like that. It's exactly the same with address. If you look at any e-commerce website, they always ask you to type in address line one and then address line two and then address line three and then postcode. Actually, these days they just ask you to type in postcode and, and number and, and the computer looks it up. But even after it looks it up, it displays on the screen as address line one, two, three, and postcode. I'm just going to put in address line one and postcode to illustrate this. But what's happening on those e-commerce websites is that each text box is feeding the data that you type in straight into one of these fields. And why would you want address line one separate from, say, postcode? It's so that at the top of a letter, you could print address line one and then have a new line and then the postcode. Or on an envelope, address line one, address line two, address line three, and then postcode. So that's the fields. What about the uh, rows? Now, each row is a record. So the rows are called the records. And each record gathers together all of the information for one particular instance of whatever it is this table is storing information about. So this table is storing information about customers. So the records are all of the fields that relate to one particular customer. In this first case, it's John Smith. So let's say John lives at 10 London Road, postcode 1234. There we have John Smith's record. 
we might have Sue Jones. She lives at 123 Fake Street. And that's 5678. Now, there are a number of rules governing these tables. And um, it's not terribly important, but the order of the columns is not relevant. So it doesn't matter. So the order of the columns doesn't matter. And the order of the records doesn't matter either. So the uh, that, that those are two of the rules, which aren't that interesting. But a third rule is quite interesting and is quite important. And it's that each record has to be unique in some way. And we can see here that our first two records are entirely unique. But let's say that John Smith has a son who's also called John. And he also lives at 10 London Road. And it's the same postcode. According to our rules, we can't have this. So we need some way of making sure that each customer is unique. And you do this by defining a particular field, probably a new field. So probably you invent a field and specify that it is always unique. And for the customer, it might be customer ID. Now, the name for this sort of field is primary key. Oh, I've just noticed Jones, not Joan. The name for this field is the primary key and the primary key is defined to be unique. In fact, the computer won't let you type in two primary keys that are the same. And you've probably got five or six primary keys on you right now. If you look into your wallet, you've probably got credit card number, that's a primary key, a bank account number, debit card number, which is different from your bank account number. You might have a student card. Your student card might have a library ID on it, a student ID, an exam ID. If you're, the, if you're a member of a sports club, there might be a sports club ID. And all of these things just uniquely identify you. If we're not talking about a human, we're talking about, let's say, a car. A car has got a number of primary keys, registration number, chassis number. There's sometimes a, a number etched into the glass on the windscreen. All of these are just primary keys. So let's give each of our customers a primary key, 11, so 10, 11 and 12. And now John Senior can be distinguished from John Junior. Incidentally, you shouldn't really assign keys sequentially like that. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And the reason is because then you can predict what a key is. So if we see the beginnings of this, we know that the next one's going to be 13, the next one's going to be 14. And it means that we could write a computer program that would go through and process all the customers. So we could say, give me customer 10, give me customer 11, give me customer 12, etc. Primary keys by uh, companies that know what they're doing aren't like this. Um, we can take a quick example. So if you look up to the top of your screen somewhere, this video has got a primary key in the URL on YouTube. So it's the, uh, the, the set of numbers, I think there's 11 of them. Numbers or letters, there's uppercase letters, lowercase letters and some numbers and some special characters as well. And that is this video's primary key. And if you go into that uh, URL and try and guess the primary key of another video. So go in and change, I don't know, a capital A to a capital B or a, a 1 to a 7 or a 3 to a Z, whatever it is. Change a few of them and see what happens. I bet that you will not find another video. And the reason is because there's way more primary keys than there are videos. It's extremely unlikely, astronomically unlikely actually, that you could go in there and find an actual video. It would be like trying to find a particular grain of sand on a beach. And the reason YouTube do this is so that we can't come along and write a program that will download all their videos. We can't download their videos because we can't find their blooming videos, that's why. So that's neither here nor there, that's just an aside. 
and this is our customer table. Now, if we go back to our definition of database, it started out as a series of related tables. So we've got one table, we might have other tables that we want to relate to this table. And informally, each thing that we want to store information about gets its own table. So we've got a table for customers, we might have a table for products, we might have a table for employees, we might have a table for locations, I don't know. But the example that we're going to do next is orders. So we're going to create an order table. Okay, here we have an order table. What might some of the fields be in the order table? Well, we know that it's going to need a primary key, so we can start order ID. Maybe the date the order was placed, that might be a field. The price, the location, uh, the employee who took the order, etc. You know, you can, you can think up fields all day long. But we're just going to stick with these three for now. So order ID 100, date placed, I don't know, 1st of August, price £103. 101 was placed on the 2nd of August and it cost £37. Okay. It should be obvious that we need to know which customers have placed which orders. For one thing, we need to know where to send the order to. And where to send the order to comes from up here. It's the address fields. So we need to relate order to customer. How do we do this? Well, it's all to do with the primary keys. To join two tables together, what you do is you take the primary key from one and you put it in the other. And in the other, it's called a foreign key. So it's a primary key in its own table. When you take it out, it's a foreign key. So let's try that. Let's take customer ID and put it down here as a foreign key. So let's say that customer 10 ordered order 100. So we would just put in a 10 there. Customer 10, uh, order 101 was also placed by customer 10 and 102 was placed by 12 and Sue Jones didn't place any orders or at least hasn't yet. And that's how we relate two tables. And much of the process of database design involves doing exactly what we've just done, deciding on what tables to implement, deciding on what fields are going to be in those tables, and deciding which primary keys to use as foreign keys.